Youth, children, released. No? Yes? They're released? Okay. I was just going to keep going. so amazing. The children and our youth are so amazing. Yeah, the future is now. The future is now. I've been praying all morning that God gives me the ability to articulate this experience in my life that brings light to you, that brings truth to you, that brings life. And I want this revelation. And I didn't understand this experience that I had until many, many years later. I had to get a little smart. And so, you know, how, how many times do you know we go through stuff in life and we look back and we see the hand of God, right? We see what he's done in our lives, yet in that moment, right? We, we can't see hardly anything, right? I'm going to go back to a moment in my life when I worked in the mill. And I met a man by the name of Anthony. Anthony was an engineer. If, if you did not know my history, I was an electrician. And we both worked in the same department. And we worked hand in hand. We'd become very close. Anthony was, is like a ray of sunshine type of individual. He's very easy to become friends with. And as you guys know, I don't like to shut up. So the reality was it was a friendship that just birthed very quickly. We had a common uh, we had a common task. We wanted to make the equipment easy, easily serviceable. You know, we looked for ways to make uh, the department move better and flow better. Made my job easier when he engineered stuff to make it fix easier. Amen. Hallelujah. So we became fast friends. One day, he confides in me that him and his wife have been trying to have children with very little success. You know, he's, he's telling me his struggles, he's telling me his problems, but they're not really in the forefront of my mind. Have you ever had somebody just kind of unload a little bit and you're like, oh man, I'm sorry for your issues and I'm sorry for your problems, but you're, it's really not the forefront of what you're dealing with in that day, right? I mean, come on. This, this happens to us at times, right? But I'm going to tell you something right now. As, as believers, as Jesus followers, we, we get these unique opportunities in life. And people will share stuff with you. They'll share stuff with you because they know you're a believer. They'll share stuff with you because they think that you will take a moment and pray for them, and that will make all the difference, right? We gotta take hold of these moments. We gotta take hold of these moments. So he confides in me that him and his wife are trying to have children, and they're, and they've they're struggling. So obviously they've tried the traditional method, and that's not working. And I'm not here to explain to you how that happens. But <laughs> they're reading books and they're timing schedules and. You know, the greatest joy of his life, he always told me when he wanted to have kids, and he keeps confiding in me these things. He says, I, I'm on my way to Cleveland Clinic, and you know, we're going to get tested. So Cleveland Clinic suggests that they do this process called artificial insemination, right? right. And his wife becomes pregnant, and they're so happy. But then he's 
Tell me of a moment when they're sitting on the couch and she's experiencing this great pain on the inside of her. She lost a baby. And he's sharing with me this grief. And I'm starting to walk this path with him. He's coming to me over and over again. Hey, man, can you just remember? That's how it starts. That's how God opens the door. Can you just remember to pray for me? And I would tell him, I prayed for you today. I prayed for your situation today. He comes to this, this crossroad, right? And I, and, I, and I know that God... Oh, I'm trying to do this story justice. I know God needs a way to show him through me that he loves him, right? right? At the time, I am being pastored at another church, and my pastor, my lead pastor, falls sick. And I'm trying to explain everything that's happening in my life at this time, right? So I'm starting to teach classes at the church I came from, and my lead pastor falls sick, and my prayer life is starting to be surrounded around that my leader is ill. So as I go to pray, my prayer life becomes consumed with the fact that my leader is sick. Now, I begin to pray, and as I pray, my mind shifts, and I find myself praying over my buddy and his wife, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, Steve, if you could just stay focused in prayer, if you could just stay focused in prayer, maybe your leader would be healed, but you can't even do that. Squirrel moment, right? I'm good for squirrel moments. <laughs> so I buckle down, and I'm going to start praying hard, right? Praying hard for my leader. I'm, I'm praying on my job at the mill. I'm praying at home. Listen, I'm praying in the shower. I'm praying. But every time I begin to pray, my mind moves. And I find myself praying for him. Now, this was a God thing, but back then I did not understand that. I did not understand that God was moving my prayer life. I was communicating with him. He was dropping thoughts into my mind, and my, and my prayer life is moving. But I chalked it up as the inability to pray properly. Okay? <laughs> it seemed like the more I prayed, the more I focused, the more I became distracted. Now, we're going to call this a daydream. We're going to call this a vision. Call it what you want. We're going to study this a little bit later. But I kept getting this vision of this toddler. And I'm telling you right now, it, is re it was as real as you guys are in this room. It was this real. I get this little toddler, and he's running through. And he looks up at me and he smiles. I can hear his father call his name. He says, Anthony, come here. But I can see this toddler smiling at me. Huh. So you know what I do? I chalk it up to a daydream. It's real. Man, this would be great if this happened in the kingdom of heaven. Right? <coughs> I would pray day after day. And I think it's about, uh, I was trying to narrow this down. I think it was a 10 days that I, as I prayed, I would see this. And as I prayed, I would see this. And as I prayed, I would see this. So I'm super excited for my buddy because I'm, I'm beginning to believe that this vision 
was what was going to happen. My problem, and listen, hmm, I know better now, but back then I was afraid. I mean, everybody's got that one crazy friend, right? They walk up and, I know what's going to happen in your life, right? I didn't want to be that nut job, that nut job friend. So I kind of held it to myself. But I had this renewed faith in me as we talked and as we prayed, I kept speaking life into him. I got that right. What I should have done was I should have stopped and prophesied right into his life right there. That's what I should have done. I didn't. I think about that. I think about that a lot. I mean... Maybe that could have been the moment that his entire family is saved and his parents are saved and his children are saved and his cousins are saved because of this miraculous event that God... Oh, sweet Jesus. But I believed, right? I, I believed this vision that I got. And, and listen, this is the first vision I got. I've only had two in my entire life. But this was the first one. Uh, so we continue to pray, right? But he comes to me this time. And he says, uh, I want you to pray with me. This was the first time this ever happened. He says, I want you to pray. Let's pray together. So I'm an electrician at the mill, and I've got keys to motor rooms and, and, and places that other people don't have access to. So I unlock one of those motor rooms, and we walk in the back. And uh, I says, man, let's just pray. And he goes, he goes, so I have to close my eyes. And I'm like, no, no, you don't have to close your eyes. I said, as a matter of fact, I'd hate for us to walk into something with a lot of electricity in it and kill ourselves. So, you know, I, when I pray, I wander. <laughs> Let's keep our eyes open, you know. <laughs> so we have this Holy Spirit-filled moment of prayer in this motor room. Man, I'm full of faith. Got me a vision. So he goes... And we're praying over this second artificial insemination, right? And he comes back and he says, she's pregnant. A month later, same thing. She experiences the pain, loses the baby. But I have a peace. I have this vision, and I'm still encouraging him. I'm still encouraging him, right? So they go up to Cleveland Clinic again, they get another consult, and they said, okay, this process isn't going to work. We're going to do something called in vitro fertilization. Now, this is it's surgical, it's expensive, there's shots, the whole nine yards. At the time, I think this is a $22,000 process. He was whining to me about the money. That's why I know that. <laughs> so what they do is they go in and they extract uh, eggs out of her. Okay, So they got 22 eggs out of her. Ten died almost instantly. They had 12, and they, and they tried this in, in, in two egg in increments. So they had six tries. Now this is over a two-year process. This is not something that is, you know, we pray for a couple days and something. This is, this is a long time. Long story short, all six attempts fail. And it comes to the apex of his frustration, and now it's, Tearing on our relationship. 
Why doesn't God love me? I'm answering all these questions. Why isn't he helping me? Why all these things he's bringing to me. And one day, he, he and, I, and I'm in a little uh, six by ten shanty, and, and that's where I stayed with in the mill. And he pulls open the door, and he says, the last trial failed. And I'm sitting there. And I almost said, it's going to be okay, buddy. But I bit my tongue. And I looked at him and I said, have faith. And he slammed the door right in my face. (laughs) So loud that it rattled my tools on the sidewall. I mean, it was bad. I thought he was going to tear the hinges off of it. You know, it, it... on the inside, I'm trying to figure out my friend. He's hurt. He's angry. My relationship with him is stressed. And it, and it seemed like forever before he would even talk to me again. But maybe a week, two weeks goes by. And when you're used to talking to somebody every day and working with somebody every day, you know, it's a long time. And he's he's. I know he's stressed out, but I, I gave him his space, and he comes back to me, and, and he begins to talk in a, a more of a tone that him and, him and I are used to talking to, and, and he says, you know, Steve, we're going to start an adoption process, the wife and I. Probably about a month goes by, and they go through all the ad- adoption process, the certifications, and they make this cool little adoption video that he shared with me. And I'm still asking the creator of the universe, you showed me something. Why hasn't it manifested? Right? Huh. <laughs> so one day he comes running into the shanty. This time he almost tears the, joy off, the door off in joy. And he says, guess what? Cleveland Clinic called. And I said, yeah. He says, they have a hope program. I said, but what's the hope program? He says, out of 50 couples, I was selected out of 50 failed families who tried to have kids. They give one family a chance to do it again for free. Wow. Out of 50 couples. Guess who they selected? They selected my buddy and his wife. Hmm. So, they pulled the first two eggs from her. She became pre- pregnant. But in that conversation, when he told me that, he says, I want to share something with you. I says, I feel in my heart this is it. And I says, it's going to be a boy. He's going to have blue eyes. And you're going to call him Anthony Jr. <coughs> Guess what? It was a boy. He had blue eyes. And his nickname is AJ. Oh. Anthony Jr. <laughs> now, this was a two-year process which stressed my relationship with him to a degree that it was ridiculous. But God moved in his life. Him and I have had wonderful conversations about how God did this in his life. He knew that it was God in his life. But my point in this conversation with you this morning, and God has told me to communicate this morning. I'm trying to control my emotions to the point where I can communicate properly to you. But we're given the power of the Holy Spirit to do what? We talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, but what are we supposed to use it for? So that we can be witnesses of Him. Witnesses, the power of the Holy Spirit is not for you. 
It's so you can be a witness. And this is what happened in this moment. Now, I don't feel I did everything like I should have. But the reality is God was going to do something. And I... I want to see the church be the church. Is anybody with me? And these things like this, I'm not telling you should be an everyday occurrence, but we all should have a story like this. At least one, maybe two, who knows, maybe three. Maybe more. Acts 2.17 says, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall. Young men shall see. And old men shall dream. I seen a vision, so that means I'm still young. Woo! That was a few years ago. Maybe I'm old. I don't know yet. <laughs> She's laughing hard, isn't she? But if you look in the book of Acts, you see all through the book of Acts, the New Testament church seen visions. They Stephen seen a vision of Jesus, Acts 7. Paul seen a vision of Ananias, Acts 9. Ananias seen a vision of Paul. The Corinthian church. Cornelius and the angel. Peter, we're going to talk about Peter today. We're going to talk about Peter and his vision. This shouldn't be the extraordinary If we are to be the New Testament church, then guess what? Dreaming dreams and vision and prophecy is a part of the church. Now it must be done in order and it must be done properly. But guess what? It's part of the church. So today I'm going to go to Acts 10, 9 through 16. I think I messed that up when I told you my scripture the other day. Acts 10. 10, 9 through 16. I'm going to read this to you. We're going to walk through this a little bit. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. And it was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. Peter stops at noon. He goes to pray. It's midday and he's on a rooftop. I think that's kind of cool. What, what great, they had flat roofs back then. Great place to pray, right? So what, what I want to draw out to you right now is that Peter went to pray. Peter, I believe it or not, some people pray because they want relationship with God. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they don't actually want something. They want to be around Jesus. They want to hear his voice. They want to feel his heartbeat. Woo. Right? But Peter went up on the housetop to pray. Now, one piece of information that I haven't given you, but there's another man. His name is Cornelius. He's a Roman centurion. He's had a vision. He's also had a vision. I'm going to read this to you. Verse 4, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? This is Cornelius. And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have come up for a memorial before God. See, Cornelius is praying over the church. He's a Gentile. At the time, the gospel has not fully come to the Gentiles. There's this vision that's being manifested, and something supernatural is going to happen here. God is moving two different men to come together who would have never have come together. One was a Roman soldier, and the other one was a Jew. They are not going to come together on their own accord. Guess what? They both seen visions, which brought them together for the glory of God, for the glory of the gospel. Okay? We need to understand a few things. They're from different cultures. They're from different worlds. They believed in God. They were all part of the kingdom. But they needed this supernatural meeting to come together 
for the glory of the king. And, and God's getting ready to move them supernaturally. Now I want you to notice something. Peter went to pray. When you're praying, and you, you're there and you're just communing for God, you're not whining, you're there for a relationship, it's okay for your mind to move you. Have you ever had this happen? You ever have been praying for something and your mind moves? See? ADD is okay. But in prayer, your mind moves to a particular situation or you see a particular face and you're like, eh, why should I be praying? God knows. The Spirit of God knows. He knows that you need to be praying for that person right now. Realize what's happening. God is trying to communicate. Communication is two ways, people. Right? So in this prayer, God is communicating back. He says, I got that first one. Don't worry about that first one. I want, here's the, here, I want pick up my heart with this one. That's what I want you to do. And the reality is, I'm going to tell you, when you get moved in prayer like that, you need to make a phone call. You need to make a connection. Something needs to happen. God's moving him. So sometimes it's not the attention span of a goldfish. Right? Verse 10, then he, which is Peter, became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now, this is the word for vision. Do we have any scripture? Okay. So, he falls into this trance, which is a vision. And this is where the Spirit of God is going to dominate you. He's going to dominate you. What you see, what you feel, will be real to you. Yet, it's a vision. But it's a message. And I'm going to give you an instance. When I was praying, I was... So let, so let me explain my working atmosphere. There's, there's these 25 to 35 foot tall furnaces, and they are melting titanium, huge, huge pieces of metal. And I'm in this basement, 25 feet below one of these furnaces. And it's so loud and it's so noisy, and there's these pumps running. You can't, with two sets of earplugs in, with earplugs in and earmuffs on, you can't hear the person beside you. It's how loud and noisy it is. And I'm wiring a motor. I'm an electrician. That's what I do. I wire motors. I wired a motor. I wired the, the, the motor leads, the thermal switches, um, the heat indicator. I wired all of this while I was seeing what was going on. And I actually finished. My hands finished doing something while my mind was seeing something else. It was the craziest thing. I thought to myself, you could kill yourself. You, you keep, you're praying real hard for this situation. You're seeing something, and your hands are still moving. That's God. I said, Lord, maybe I should lock the switch out before I start doing this stuff. But I guarantee you, he protect me no matter what. Verse 11. And saw heaven open. Now this is Peter. He's seeing his vision. We're, we're seeing his vision right here. And saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound by the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. Now God, he, he, he's being dramatic in his vision because Peter, in his vision, he's looking up and he sees this monstrous blanket, this monstrous sheet, and it's descending from heaven to earth below him, right? And I ask myself, why did God, didn't, didn't God have a relationship with Peter? Right? They, they communed, they prayed, they talked. Why did God, why did Jesus have to give him a vision? You ever think of that? Like, you ever think, why? Why didn't he just communicate with that still small voice in the back of his head and say, this is what I want you to do, this is where I want you to go? Why a vision? Did 
This is my best thought process. And I'm not saying this is an absolute, but this is what I'm thinking. You can argue with me, and that's fantastic, but I think it has to do with filters. The specific ways that people think. Example. Most married Christians fight more on Sunday before church. Right? Satan attacks the family. He doesn't want them to go to church. Right? So they, 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 you're going to make me late. One's on time, one's not. Right? You're still putting your makeup on. Yeah, well, I can't find my shoes. Why do we even go to church to begin with? Right? I call this filters. So when you come into this building, sometimes I know I can feel it. I can feel you've been fighting. Right? So, when I, so, so a lot of times when I open up a message, I do it with a joke or a funny experience to ease and settle people. Right? It's filtering. It's trying to reach somebody who has a wall. Are you with me? Okay. Now, Peter, I know he's known for a lot of knuckleheaded situations, but guess what? He was a devout Jew. God had to break through the filter of religion. Think about it for a moment. And he had to do it in a supernatural way. You know, I mean, think about this for a minute. Peter could have been the first. If, if Peter thought that the, the gospel had only come to the Jews, him and Paul got into, into a furious fight later on. But if he had thought that salvation had only come to the Jew, not the Gentile, everybody who is not a Jew is considered a Gentile, right? He could have been the first Calvinist. Salvation's only for my people because I'm so special. God had to break through that filter of religion. I mean, he wasn't as bad as a Pharisee. But there was a religious filter that he had to break. Don't you dare call something unclean that I have called clean. It's a filter. It's a wall. Ooh. You also jumped up at that one. <laughs> but listen, he's got preconceived things in his mind. And the way he was raised. This, ha right, this happens to us all the time. In the way that we're raised. Our DNA structure. Our personalities. We have filters. God says, listen, I have to bring you a vision I need you to do something to move the entire kingdom of heaven. I need a shift down there on the earth, son. And I'm going to give you a vision so the gospel goes out. Amen. Verse 12. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals on the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. Now, we're getting ready to challenge Peter's religion. Right? Right? We're going to challenge the very way, the very aspect of his life. <laughs> We're going to upside down his apple cart. <laughs> right? We're going to step on his culture a little bit. Amen. We know Levitical law forbids the eating of many animals, right? right. It violates how God set the, 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 the structure up. And, and, and during the law, he says, you know what? You can eat anything with scales. But you can't eat shrimp, crab, oysters. I love shrimp. Even though I'm allergic, I know. I know. She got to pray over me every time we go, oh, you can eat sh shrimp at Red Lobster. <laughs> but guess what, short man? Your grilled cod's okay, baby. You're in. But you weren't allowed to eat peg. No bacon. No ham. No bacon. Did I tell you no bacon? Chocolate covered bacon. Woo. Speaking of chocolate covered, now creepy crawly things are going to be okay. Chocolate covered ants are on the menu, baby. 
But do you see what's going on here? And, and he follows up. He says, listen, Cornelius, there's going to be some people coming. He's, he's, he follows it up with a word of knowledge. Verse 13. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, this is the first time that, that he's being instructed by Jesus. He tells him, listen, kill and eat. This was a vision, but listen, it's inconceivable to think in Peter's mind that I'm going to do something that is displeasing to God. Okay? You're going to see this. He's saying, listen, you can, you can eat anything on this sheet. It's clean. <laughs> Does anybody know why we pray over our food? Why, why, why do we even pray over our food? Anybody have an idea? Why, 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 like, we all do this. We do this very ritualistic, right? right? We sit down. We have a meal. Who's going to pray? Right, we pray over our meals. We do this, don't we? Why? Well, let's, let's, let's consult the scripture, shall we? <laughs> First Timmy 4, 4 or 5 says this, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Say thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. This is why we pray over our food. Because when it's done in thanksgiving, it is sanctified. It is prayed over. And it is clean. Amen. I always tell Luke, even the Lord, the three bites he's already eaten, Lord, sanctified in his stomach. I know you can do it, Lord. So guess what? Pig and shrimp and bacon is back on the table, baby. Yeah. We pray over our, we do it with thanksgiving. Verse 14, but Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Ah, we, we, the wall of religion right here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to. Listen and obey the law of what's going on here. So Peter, ooh, Peter refuses to eat as any good Jew would. Hmm. I'm going to say it to you again. Who are we to tell God what is clean and unclean? Who are we to make that? But guess what? Peter was a good Jew. He observed the law. He was devoted. Man, so here we go. Verse 15, and a voice spoke to him again. The second time, say second time. That's right, because he couldn't get it the first time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. He's doing it again, right? Jesus says, listen, I, I'm reiterating this. This is clean. And this is a huge leap of faith. Remember, Peter's got to leave the structure of the law. And now he's got to come and eat in faith. This is big. We do this. We grew up in this. This was our culture, right? But not him. He needed a vision to move him from here to there. Huge leap of faith for him. Verse 16. This was done three times and the object was taken up into the heaven. Now, listen. I guess Peter's magic number is three. Right? <laughs> Deny Christ three times. I need to be told three times. But here's what I'm going to tell you. We might think he's a slow learner, but listen, listen to this for a minute. The visions, are when they're from God, they're significant in the aspect that, one, they'll repeat. Two, the details will never change. The detail will never change. This is what I noticed. I, I went back. And I'm, I'm rehashing, and listen, I have been thinking about this moment in my life for weeks now, weeks. Lord, explain this to me. I don't understand. Where did I mess up? But the one thing that was shown to me was that this, this vision that I had with, with the little boy, was, it was the same vision over and over and over again. It didn't change. And when I seen this in my mind, the little boy smiling up at me, 
Then it went away. I heard his father's voice calling his name. Then it went away. When you're having this with God, it, it, it's, it's the same. It's not going to change. It might repeat. It should repeat, I think. I don't have full understanding of this, but I would, I would think that it needs to repeat and the detail should never change. Amen? Amen? But the reality was this. Was the vision that we're dealing with, was it really about clean and unclean food? No. No, it was about salvation. It was about people. You go to the Gentiles. You give them the gospel. You tell them that I love them. I'm here for them. I'm their savior. I'm their redeemer. You tell them about me. And don't you dare call them common or unclean. Because what I have made clean and what I have saved has eternal value in heaven. And it took a vision. It took a supernatural interceding from God to get past his filter. Do we understand this? All right, I'm going to call, the, I'm gonna call uh, Mercy Music up here. But I'm going to read this verse to you, and I, and I think it may be a beat to the punch, but Acts 10, 28, 29 says this. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company